We're looking at another question that involves these ninth roots of unity. Surprisingly useful these things are. We're also going to be using some of our knowledge of polynomials. It's really going to push an understanding of uh, roots and intercepts and factors. So let's dive right in. First, it says, find the ninth roots of unity. Now we've had a look at, uh, you know, being able to just say off the bat without any other kind of derivation or working what the roots of unity are. Uh, and that's because we know they have very many predictable properties. For example, um, if we call the roots of unity Z, you know, Z1, Z2, Z3, and so on, we number one know that the first root of unity is always one because uh, one is a root of itself. Uh, but when we think about the rest of the roots, number one, we know there are nine in total. Uh, so I'm going to have eight more to write. Uh, and secondly, I also know that they are all evenly spaced around the circumference of the unit circle, just like one is. We're going to start from one, go anti-clockwise around until we you know, run out of ones that we can fit within the principal argument. And then we'll go the other way around and do it clockwise. So um, once I start at one, if I go, uh, you know, a ninth the way around the circle, that's a ninth of two pi radians. So therefore, and I'm going to write this in exponential form just because it's the most concise. I can write the next of the ninth roots of unity as e to the i two pi on nine. So that's the next one around. And then I'm just going to keep on going until I get as far or as close to uh, pi radians as I can. So the next one over will be four pi on nine. Then you're going to get 6 pi on 9. Uh, the last one that I can fit as I go around anti-clockwise is 8 pi on 9 because you can see if I added another 2 pi on 9, um, I would hit 10 pi on 9, which is a non-principal argument. So as I said before, instead of continuing around anti-clockwise, we're now going to start from 1, which is an argument of 0, and go clockwise, which will give me negative arguments. So it's going to give me, uh, in order, Clockwise, I'll get i to the negative 2 pi on 9. I'm going to get e to the i negative 4 pi on 9. And it's really just going to be um, the same numbers that I got before, just negative instead of positive. So I can squeeze negative 6 pi on 9 just there. And I'll, I reckon I can tuck negative 8 pi on 9 underneath. So when you have a look, make sure you got them all. You've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Nine ninth roots of unity. Everything's great. So those are the ninth roots. That's that's all that part A is asking for. But before we dive into part B, I'm going to do just a little bit of extra groundwork so that uh, parts B and C will be easier. Now, normally when I do these solutions, I'll write everything um, live. Uh, but one of the things that is going to emerge as we go through this working is that there is a lot of working to do. It's going to be the main bottleneck. It's just going to be the speed of my writing. And I am a slow writer. So what you can see I've done here is I've got a bit of my working, which I've done beforehand, a bit, the vast majority of it. Uh, and we're going to use that to, to speed through things, but I will explain everything as we go. Um, so if you're riding along at home, just pause if you want to catch up with all the writing that I've done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of write all these answers in a sort of tabular form. You can see there's the same solutions, Z1 through 9. And what I want to do is also point out that there's relationships between the roots and uh, you know describing them in a more succinct way will just make my, easy, my, my working easier. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, look, I've got one, and then I've got all of those, those first four of the ninth roots that I got by going anti-clockwise around, right? So there were four extra ones. What I'm going to do, just to make things easier to talk about, is I'm just going to give them some Greek letters. That's normally how we indicate the roots of a polynomial. So I'm going to call them alpha, beta, there's gamma, and I'll write in delta right there. Now when you have a look at the other four roots, you can see that because they have this relationship with the angles that I've already pointed out, right? Um, you can see this negative pi on 9 matches with this 2 pi on 9. The relationship between these two is that those are conjugates of each other. You know, you're rotating the same way around or the same angle around uh, anti-clockwise versus clockwise. So therefore, um, I don't have to use a new Greek letter for this. I don't have to call it uh, epsilon, I guess in this case. I can say this is alpha bar, um, which sort of highlights the relationship with this earlier complex root that we got here. Um, and I can do the same thing for all of these subsequent roots. This will be beta bar, um, this will be gamma bar, and then this one will be delta bar, okay? So uh, this is what we get out of the fact that, um, as I've talked about before, this thing called the complex conjugate root theorem. When you have a polynomial, um, like for example, z to the 9 
minus one equals zero. That's the polynomial that gives us these nine solutions. Because all the coefficients are real, all of the roots will come in conjugate pairs. And that's exactly what we see here. Alpha, alpha bar, beta, beta bar, and so on. Okay, so where do I go with this? Well, I'm now ready to start uh, moving into part B, now that I've got a concise way to talk about all nine of these roots. So when we have a think about this, right? This is where we're going to begin. Z to the nine minus one, which I said was the polynomial which gives us these solutions. I can write it in this factorized form because I have all nine of the roots. Now just to remind you what this means, right? If I said to you, oh, okay, here's, here's a polynomial, right? Um, let's say X squared, give you an example like minus 5x plus 6. Okay, so if I said that equals 0, we can factorize this and then get the roots out of it, right? Um, did I choose some nice easy numbers? I don't know if I did. I think I chose disaster numbers. Let's just change that plus 6. Uh, let's change that into a minus. That'll be, that'll be more interesting. Okay, so here the pair of numbers that's going to factorize this nicely will be uh, x minus 6 and x plus 1 equals 0. From which you could say that the roots of this uh, quadratic would be negative 1 or 6. Now what I'm going to do, what you can see me doing in this line, is going in reverse, right? Instead of saying here's the factorization, therefore here are the roots, what I've got here is here are the roots, therefore here is the factorization that goes with it. You can see I have nine linear factors. There are no uh, z squareds or z cubes. They're all just z to the power of one. And then each one is paired with one of the nine roots. Alpha, alpha bar, beta, beta bar, and so on. Okay, so since z1, z2, through to z9, z9 are the solutions of this polynomial, z to the nine minus one, that allows me to rewrite it in this way. Okay, so what can I do with this? Well, if you have a think about this, right? What I'm trying to get to, if you have a look at this result that I'm trying to prove, see, see this? This thing here, um, it's, it's got quadratic factors, you see that? So instead of the linear factors that I have here, z uh, to the one, z to the one, and so on, you can see that somehow I'm going to have to combine pairs of linear factors to give me quadratic factors. So it really is about pairing up in a sensible way to make the simplification as easy as possible. And you can actually see I've already begun to do this. I haven't written these um, factors in the same order as I wrote these, these roots up here, right? I've paired up intentionally alpha with alpha bar. You can see that as my, um, whoopsie daisy, that's very, very thin. Let's try and make that a little easier to write. Um, that's my first pair of linear factors here. Um, you can see it keeps going. Here's z minus z bar and so on. So the reason why this is useful is because combining complex number with its conjugate allows for us to simplify a bunch of things. So to remind you of how this works, let's just consider some uh, general complex number, uh, you know, omega for example, and then say, oh, okay, what happens if I add these two numbers together, the complex number and its conjugate, or what happens if I multiply? These are going to be two results that are going to be both important to me when I actually go and do these expansions, okay? So first what I'm going to say is, what happens when we add? Well, by definition, what I'm going to get is a plus ib plus a minus IB, right? So this is handy because my IBs are going to cancel with each other. So in this case, I would just be left with 2a, um, but a more helpful way to write it in a context, uh, in the context that we're working with, is to say that a is the real component of omega, our random complex number. So I'm going to write that as 2 times the real component of omega. All right, so far so good. What happens over here when we multiply? Well, what you're getting here is the difference of squares, aren't you? This is um, a plus b times a, sorry, a plus ib times a minus ib. So you're going to get an a squared b squared situation, except it's not a squared b squared, it's a squared i squared b squared because um, the ib is being squared there, right? So this is going to be um, a squared, it's actually the sum of squares. And the reason why this is useful to me is because when you think about the connection between this and our original complex number, this, this rings a bell. This looks a whole lot like Pythagoras, doesn't it? And that's because this is part of our formula for finding the modulus of a complex number. So if I multiply a complex number by its conjugate, what I'm really getting is the square of the modulus, okay? So this is gonna be really useful when I then say, all right, let's take these results 
And we're now going to think about expanding these pairs of um, linear factors which have a complex number and its conjugate. Let's go ahead and see what actually emerges. So I'm just going to go uh, term by term here, right? I'm going to get z squared uh, minus alpha bar z. There's the first expansion. Then I'm going to go minus alpha z and then I'm going to add alpha alpha bar. So far so good. Um, I can go one step further and I can do a bit of factorization to make the results that I just established a bit easier to see. So you've got your z squared out here. I'm going to subtract and then here I'm going to factor out z. So that leaves me with an alpha plus alpha bar. This is the number plus its conjugate that we saw earlier and, and that's multiplied by z. Okay, so in this context, I can say um, I, I know what this, these results are going to be equal to, right? Um, I've got 2 times the real component of whatever complex number I started with, which in this case is alpha, and that's multiplied by z. And then along the end here, I have the modulus of, uh, not z, but alpha, that's the particular complex number that, I'm, um, that I've got multiplying by its conjugate here. Um, that thing is being squared. Okay, now at this point, we're almost there to use this result um, many, many times. I know what alpha is. Alpha is just my shorthand for um, this particular one of the roots, the ninth roots of unity, right? So that tells me two things. Number one, e to the i 2 pi on 9, that's just shorthand, as you recall, for polar form, right? Um, cos 2 pi on 9 plus i sine 2 pi on 9. So down here in my working, right here, where I want the real component of alpha, the real component of alpha is this. It's the cos 2 pi on 9. This is the imaginary part that I'm going to discard. So this is really good because you can see, if I have a look at this result, um, I've got a z squared and I've got 2 cos 2 pi on 9 z. That's the, the real component of z that I've noticed here, or alpha I should say in this case. So what I can do is for this example, z minus alpha times z minus alpha bar, I can say I get z squared, I've left it on purple, z squared minus 2 cos 2 pi on 9, that's my, uh, my real component of alpha, um, that's being multiplied by z, and because I've got these roots of unity, right, the roots of unity all lie on the unit circle, this is what we noticed before, so therefore the modulus of alpha and the modulus of beta and the modulus of all the other of the ninth roots, the modulus is just 1. So really I'm getting 1 squared on the end which is 1. So this is what happens when I take these pairs of linear factors that include these complex conjugates in them, uh, it simplifies out to this and this is the term that I'm going to have to use, or this is the expression rather, I'm going to have to use over and over again because this is not the only pair of linear factors I've got. I've got this pair and I've got this pair and I've got this pair as well. Okay. So if I use this, this result here, and I just use it repeatedly in, um, in this line here, which I've, I've named this equation 1, so if I take all of these pairings and use this result, um, this is what you end up with. Bam! So you can see um, z to the 9 minus 1, that's what I started with, right? z minus 1, it hasn't paired up with anything because um, 1 is its own complex conjugate, doesn't have every real number is its own complex conjugate. But then these results here, if, you just, if I just highlight this, right? You can see this one is the first one right here. And then as you go along the line, um, this one here is the same result, but instead of 2 pi on 9, it's 4 pi on 9. It's just for beta and beta bar. This is for gamma and gamma bar. This is for... Uh, delta and delta bar, keep all of the, the roots straight. 